be certainly a lot, a uh, lot slower, but certainly at a uh, much higher distance. Uh, the Blackhawks tend to fly just at a little bit yeah, lower quite a altitude. Difference there. <laughs> yep, you can definitely see the Park View uh, Mobile Home Park, and uh, again, it, it, it just almost looks like little landing pads in the road. The only difference is with airplanes, sometimes there's Corbett Field. That's what I was talking about. Sometimes you get those little temperature inversions, and that's when sure. you see the big jostle. It's like the turbulence in an airplane. <laughs> well, that's right, and it especially makes it interesting when you're literally hanging out the window. There's nothing between <laughs> me and a thousand feet of mine on. So you had your life jacket on, right? A life jacket and parachute. <laughs> Try to put those that's two right. on at once. It gets interesting. As we swung around here a little bit, you can see where the Broadway uh, Bridge is at and how the mouse uh, really opens up as we showed you on that satellite imagery yesterday that the uh, the uh, USGS has come out with what Minot was before with the river and what it is now and how Minot almost has become a virtual lake as it's spread out through the entire river valley. This kind of gives a broader view again at the height of a thousand feet and kind of trying to hold steady as we were getting bounced around there a little bit but kind of a open view of what the Arrowhead Mall looks like and then that 16th Street run uh, as the houses are lined up again that looks more like fjords than actual city streets and uh, which really does make it so difficult you can see the Crooked Elementary. Perfect. Yes, which they did uh, unload those two-ton sandbags and they had some luck there. I know I, I spoke with uh, with Dr. Lyson today and as we're going to mention coming up later, he said that the, that the sandbags did save that there's not water in the school except for just a sewer backup right now. And they still had some of that equipment hooked up in this Black Hawk, uh, Black Hawk that we were flying on earlier, not in the plane here, but in that Black Hawk that we were flying on earlier. Look at the traffic jam. If, if that uh, just doesn't uh, unnerve you what a little bit. What time of day was that? This was at uh, right around 1245, 1 o'clock. So this was a little bit earlier in the afternoon, right mm -hmm. around the noon rush. And, and that's again why I kind of headed up to Lake Darling yep. and all the way around. I needed to tra for, travel about uh, 45 to 50 miles out of my way instead of the six miles. I took the scenic route. <laughs> I took the very scenic <laughs> route, which also gave me an opportunity to take a look at uh, some of the farm fields as I really have, uh, have been uh, almost anchored to the desk mm -hmm. this past entire week and the week before. So good chance to do some sightseeing as well. A little more open view of the area just outside of Terracita of Lejo uh, near that 50th Street Northwest uh, County Road that typically is very accessible, but uh, not anymore. Green Thumb Nursery and uh, the reason we always kind of uh, point out these landmarks to give you an idea if you're familiar with the area. Uh, County Road 17 that has long since been lost. We've uh, uh, we closed that road up nearly three weeks ago already and not clear when that road will even be opened up again. One little green spot out in the middle there. I had I had somehow managed to miss that or at least in my own viewfinder. Uh, the house with the ring dike around it right outside of uh, Del Nor Drive. Uh, another kind of slower look at it as we kind of wing through there earlier. That really is just a, an amazing sight. I guess for anybody who hasn't been following, uh, yesterday we've, dro we've dropped about a foot in the river since yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I just from even 500 feet or 1,000 feet, there's really not very noticeable at all. We were in the boats in Burlington the day before. We could see the mud marks now. As the water starts to drop on those houses, it leaves those defined marks sure. where the water had actually reached. And uh, it looked yesterday as it gone down about eight inches from when it crested. And I'm sure it's gone down maybe three, four more inches off of that so getting down to that close to one foot mark off where its actual high mark was early that uh, Sunday morning or late Saturday night in Burlington. There's so much water and it just makes you where is it all going to go and you know it's going to go back but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just it's hard to imagine. And the difference with the city and I think the rural developments is people have been asking okay so how are they going to get this water out of Minot when the river actually drops back into its channel. The answer in the city is most likely city crews will go to those storm sewers, drop in their pumps, 
and then draw down the streets that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, the natural flow that they've created within the drainage system within cities, uh, which should help uh, get those pumped out fairly quickly. I would like to think uh, in terms of uh, you know relative time, we're not talking hours, we're most, most likely talking days, and then I think it's going to be up to much of uh, the individual homeowners as we get back and start to assess and uh, clean up our yards as well because we know what happens in North Dakota when uh, water starts standing anywhere for too long and starts to warm up. Our pesky little winged friends start to return. River Road, this was the video that Catherine had shown about uh, the trailers that had come off their foundations and, and, and fell into each other. Yep, yep, you can see it right there, right off of Colton Avenue. I know a lot of people were trying to get their trailers out before the waters came in, and some people did succeed in that. One of the more, uh, one of the big differences, I think, between this flood and the 69 flood, a lot of people have asked, well, why didn't they just hook onto the, all those trailers and all the different courts and just pull them to higher ground the way they did uh, some of them in 69? A lot of the big difference between now and 1969 is uh, there were still tires on some of those trailers rather than up on blocks, up on cinders, and then down. anchored right exactly. to the ground. Uh, time certainly just wouldn't allow uh, being able to get in there, get them all unhooked, get them uh, all the surfaces cut, yep. and move them in any real uh, manner to get even a good number of oh, them out. My Kyle in control, I believe they helped somebody move a trailer out that was anchored, and I, I, I don't recall how long he said it took, but it was it took a little bit of time. It's no easy task. No. They're they're made to withstand some of these vicious North Dakota winds that we get with severe thunderstorms that will push that 100 miles an hour. So mm -hmm. it's not a matter of just going in and uh, turning a twisty tie right. <laughs> <laughs> to That's to right. get it they're untethered. Anchored. If you look right there in the center of your screen, that's the one that kind of caught me. You can see just the rooftop sticking out of that area right along uh, County Road 15 that we're flying right over the top of. It's right near 75th Street Northwest. Just rooftop and rooftop in that area. And it's hard to tell here as Eric just sat down to get ready for sports. That's the Minot Country Club. You can see the pine trees that kind of make out the fairways and the clubhouse and the uh, some of the work buildings out there. I've kind of gotten used to identifying some of this by the pine trees that make up the fairways both at the Surus and at, at the Minot Country Club. A little sneak peek I think as I pan down here a little bit uh, as we pulled into or across 19th Avenue Northwest. Fighting a pretty good headwind so you can kind of tell where that wind just jostles the camera around a little bit. And the bottom left of your screen, a lot of people have been asking about the Dakota Boys Ranch. There it is. It is behind a dike system. It is dry. And that's pretty much just a straight shot to the north from Del Nor Drive, where they had also managed to win their flood fight uh, against the mouse. I think between them, Chaparral and Sawyer and Velva and a few individual ring dike houses, uh, there, that was about the extent of communities or individuals that were able to save. There were a few more ring dikes here and there that managed to do a, a fantastic job as well, but uh, as far, by far, that was not the case with the majority. Again, if you missed it earlier, uh, Mayor Kurt Zimbelman was talking about numbers, uh, talking about that nearly one-fifth of homes in Minot uh, not including a lot of the subdivisions in, Bur in Burlington, but he figures, according to FEMA numbers, that one-fifth of the homes in Minot could actually have to be demolished, uh, basically come in and doze to the ground because of the extensive damage. Those that either suffered uh, that 10 feet of water or even more in some areas, and depending on whether or not uh, it was a single story or two story, and uh, how far that reached up in there. And in all, in total, nearly 4,100 homes in Minot uh, are within that flood zone. And you're talking about, of those 4,100, 805 have more than 10 feet of water. 802 of that 4,100 are submerged in roughly six feet of water. And then 2,400 fall into that category of six to 10 feet of water. And uh, mentioning the, the FEMA there, again, we want to just uh, 
say that number again. It's 1-800-621-FEMA. That's 3362. That's 1-800-621-3362. And just to kind of give you an idea of what FEMA can do for you for individuals and household programs, and this is for the, the needs that can't be met through insurance or other forms of disaster assistance, there are grants available for you in two categories. In the housing assistance, uh, the funds included are for temporary housing, which a lot of people are going to be needing here. It's funds for a place to live for a limited period of time. I'm not sure exactly how long that time is, but they will tell you that. And usually a rental unit or a hotel. And also the um, grants included for repair, which is money to repair disaster-related damage to a primary residence. And the grants are limited to repairs necessary to make a home safe, sanitary, and functional. And other needs that FEMA assistance can provide for um, they may include basic household items such as your furniture and your appliances, so you could get help for that. Uh, clothing, job related tools and educational materials, as well as repair or replacement of a primary vehicle, clean up items just to clean everything up, and disaster related medical and dental uh, costs. So there's help out there. And uh, you know, you just have to call that hotline and, and, get, and get registered, I guess is, is how you would say it. Um, and it's really not a very difficult process, believe it or not. Uh, I had 20 minutes of time tonight for the first time since Monday, last Monday, when the call came out for evacuation. And uh, that's, that was the first time I've actually had the opportunity to call and uh, get a hold of the FEMA folks to get my name into their processing center and essentially making that first step. And. Uh, answering some very basic in information. I'll kind of go through that uh, as far as what you're going to need. First, you better have a pen and paper. They're gonna give you some numbers, phone numbers, and some confirmation codes, your ID number, which is really important, and then the disaster number uh, as well. Along with that, you'll need social security numbers of not only yourself, but your spouse, any children, or any people that were living in that home. If you had your mother or father living in that home with you, you'll need those numbers as well. I just want to point out real quick as we're going over here, look at the immensity of that Broadway dike system. It's almost difficult to get an idea from the air, but it truly is a ridiculously large uh, clay dike that they have built up there. And Which is why there's, it's, it's at this point they're hesitant on having people driving on Broadway. I know there were questions about, you know, why can't a bus drive up and down Broadway? Well, you're still putting people's lives at risk when they don't know that it's safe and secure. So until they know that, yep. they just don't want anybody on there, whether you be in a bike, a bus, or a vehicle. And that's going to be uh, a cons most likely an issue as water goes down. Uh, there's still a tremendous amount of pressure, even at the level that we're at. We are still over two feet above the record crest that was set back in the late 1880s, 1881. So we, we're still at a very, well, and look at the video, it, it tells the truth there. Um, but just getting back to the FEMA thing for a second too, the social security numbers, and then you also need a little bit of tax information. They're gonna ask you about what your gross income was last year. And uh, from that too, you will need, uh, if you want direct deposit, you'll need your routing number and then bank account number. And from, I think that's about it, if memory serves correct, uh, just some very basic information. Get your names in the computer and then they're, they're, they will set up a, a meeting where you will meet with a FEMA representative. And a lot of people have been asking, well, they're asking to meet at this location or this location. Well, um, they will, they're still going to be doing that. They will call you. Now, what the regional operations uh, director of FEMA told us is that this is also a time to have your guard up substantially yes. and if a person calls you claiming to be a FEMA representative they will never ask you about your financial information or personal information like social security number bank account when they call you right now that information you when you call, call FEMA to that 1-800 number uh, you will have that information give them that information to them to get them in the system but when they call you absolutely not uh, mm -hmm. That, uh, that is the, uh, the only perfect time to give your social security number and financial information is when you call FEMA, not when they call you back, just to be on the safe side. And then when you meet with the FEMA representatives, uh, they're going to uh, go through a short, uh, I believe it's a five or ten minute little session. Uh, the person I talked with on the phone said that uh, w there, there will be a damage assessment and he was very aware of the fact that, that damage assessment.